that God cannot lie. He promised to save his people. He never changed his mind. Today he still calls them my people. My people. My people. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. So on behalf of myself and Alice and Mark, I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the precious name, the only name given by which many can be saved, the name that is above all names. We're so glad that we can be together and spend time with you in the Word. Yes, we are. Because we love to spend time in the Word. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing on. We're actually near the conclusion of our, our, our study on the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And uh, this is our 27th or 28th? 28th, I believe. 28th part of this study. Mm -hmm. That means there's about 28 hours worth of study here on the Bible Talk website on this subject. And it's an important subject because these seven letters reveal the things that are pleasing to the Lord and the things that are displeasing to the Lord. Yes. And speaking of displeasing to the Lord, we are in the letter to the church at Laodicea. Yeah. And there is a church that is displeasing yes. to the Lord. Mm -hmm. But before we get into it again on this session, I want to ask Mark if you'll just ask God's blessing on our time together. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I'm just thankful that we have the opportunity yes, to come Lord. to learn your word. Yes, sir. Lord, just put it in our hearts and put it in our minds. Amen. 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 I, I honestly believe that this is probably the most relevant part of our entire study uh, because I believe it is pertinent to the times. You know, we're supposed to be able to recognize the signs of the times. We don't know when the end is. People have been proclaiming the end of the world for the last couple of thousand years, as a matter of fact. Uh, and while I'm not here to do that, I do believe that Jesus requires that we should be able to see the signs. He says that in, the, in Matthew 24. And seeing those signs, we should recognize that the end is near. Yes. And be prepared. And rejoice. And rejoice, for our salvation draweth nigh. <clears throat> so, I think that these are the days of the Church of Laodicea. I think we have made that transition, or in the final stages of that transition, where where there is the Church of Laodicea, and then there is a remnant of faithful bond servants to Jesus Christ yes. left. I had a question: If these seven churches are in chronological order, uh, I know there's a dotted line between them, and there's a, a transition. A yeah. transition. But when did the transition from the Church of Philadelphia? which is the Church of Brotherly Love, to the Church of Laodicea happen? Well, for, first of all, let me say, in the beginning of this study, and if you've not seen that, it is still up on the site and will remain there, so you can go back and look at it in our introduction. I talked about the, there are different approaches to this. First of all, the seven letters to these seven churches are historical. These are historical churches that have a place in time and space. Mm -hmm. So when John was on the island, imprisoned on the island of Patmos around 90 AD, and the Lord gave him these letters to transmit to the churches, mm -hmm. those seven churches are actual churches that exist, and these letters pertain to where they were with him at that point in time. But then as Mark says, they're kind of a chronological order. They, the, the, the historical periods of time mm -hmm. in the church, and I think that's a, a valid interpretation. So the church... Of, the Church of Philadelphia, you said the Church of Brotherly Love, which is basically where the word, you know, comes from. Um, it actually was named by a king in honor of his love for a brother, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's where the name of the city came from. But there was, in the last century, there was truly an evangelistic outreach, an, an outreach of the gospel. Uh, there was a door open where missionaries went around the world spreading and bringing the gospel in ways that hadn't been done as powerfully as that since the New Testament times. So, but sometime, um, probably in the late 1900s, you can see that missionary zeal begin to wane, okay? That zeal for the, for the gospel. 
now, this may be oversimplifying things, but more of the resources of the church here in the West, which has the world's wealth, uh, it seems more of that wealth has gone into building up the, the assets, the kingdom of the church here, rather than a zeal for using those resources to spread the gospel. Years ago, we studied the book of Revelation. And it wasn't on tape, but it was at the Sanford House of Praise. Yeah. You had about a, a long time in preparation for verse 1 1. Yeah. You discussed Ernst Dichter? Oh, Ernst Dichter, yes. When did that ha happen? Ernst Dichter was in the. Uh, Probably around in the 50s, mm -hmm. 1950s. So, but, but just so people know what you're okay. talking about, we talked about behavioral sciences, which is was very important, and it's like the reshaping of people. For um, what purpose? Well, for what purpose? Well, this it says in First John 5:19 that this present earth, this world, is in the power of the evil one, and mm -hmm. his purpose is to separate us from Jesus Christ. What was their purpose? The human being purpose. To separate you from your money. To separate, to sell product. Right. Yeah. So they were trying to get the people in the world or in this country to focus on themselves, to spend on themselves. You, you're taking my mind a long, long way back. Um, but that could well, be let, the let, transition let, time. Yeah, let, me, let me just think here a second. Okay. Uh, because one of the things that happened was there was a conscious effort that that arose with the advent of television marketing. And I'm going, going back to the late 40s, 1940s and 50s, when advertising was basically a new science. And the purpose was, I, I, I can't give you direct quotes now, I'm, I'm going back in my head here, 30, 40 years, was to take a nation that had what was known as a Protestant work ethic, okay? Now remember, this is before the 60s and the me generation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This was in a time they were speaking to a generation of people who had gone through incredible and immense sacrifice during the Second World War. Okay? And during that Second World War, they had very little, I mean, they had sacrifice. They were, you know, they were, everything was rationed in this country, and this country had it better than, than most. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. So now that what they were trying to do, and it, they actually stated that they were trying to get rid of this this Protestant, that's what they called it, ethic of saving, mm. of, of, you know, doing hard work and, and not spending money until you had it. Right. Because the whole focus of this was to get you to spend money. That was, that's the whole focus. Now, you know, I have some experience in this. You know, I was, a, I was a president of a small ad agency in New York many, many years ago. And that, that is ultimately the purpose of marketing is to get you to buy something, to get you to buy a product or a service. And and, uh, and they had to, this is why, I mean, credit was seen as a very, very bad thing, a very mm -hmm. negative thing mm -hmm. back in my parents' That's time, right. right? So they had to they had to reform the way Americans thought. And make and they said this, they talked about how they had to get them to to enjoy or practice or hedonism, mm. which is where they, they don't have any guilt feelings about that spending is. incredible amounts of money on their own pleasure, <clears throat> right. All right? Because up at that time, it wasn't about your pleasure. You know, it was, I'm, I'm trying to think, I don't know, it was Tom Brokaw wrote a book a number of years ago about the greatest generation, talking about the, the generation of my parents, you know, mm -hmm. the Second World War, and probably, you know, your parents and many of you out there. It was a time of sacrifice, and these people had Absolutely. been raised with, with sacrifice. And now, all of a sudden, manufacturers and the, the industries that were building up, they didn't want you sacrificing. They wanted you spending. They wanted you indulging. They wanted you to be self-indulgent. They wanted you to be hedonistic. So they had these advertising agencies back then, as they do now. Every major advertising agency that I've ever known of had behavioral scientists, psychologists on staff to get into people's heads to try and change the way they think. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't think that's true, just just look at the obvious facts. You know, we just passed the time when the uh, this the, the Super Bowl, 
yes. took place here in the United States of America. And I don't know this year, you know, what the statistics are, but companies literally spent millions and millions of dollars to produce an, uh, advertisements and then buy a 30-second block of time to get into your head. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think that they're going to spend millions upon millions of dollars to get into your head for 30 seconds, and you don't think that they believe they can affect the way that you think, that's pretty silly. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's all about is changing the way you think. And by the way, that's what Jesus Christ was all about. The first message that Jesus Christ really preached when he came out of the wilderness was repent. That's right. And to repent is to change your mind, to change the way you think, mm -hmm. to restore, to bring people back to that right relationship with God the Father involves changing the way that you think. So that certainly begins a transition where, you know, but to make this, to give it a little biblical bent, which is a good idea in a Bible study, <laughs> yeah. the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and says, in the last days, men will be lovers of self. I don't want to put too much weight on this, but one of the most common words in the American English language today is selfies. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's a new one. Everybody's taking pictures of themselves, yeah. right? Selfies. Yeah. They'll be they'll be lovers of money. Well, it shouldn't take much for you to see the evidence of that. Yes. All right. Now, money has always been important to people forever. Mm -hmm. But the greed that exists in the world today, which, by the way, Scripture calls idolatry, right. is almost overwhelming. Right. And he says it'll be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. There will probably be more people uh, tonight just to, to date this. Uh, you know, we're, and again, we're recording this for a release next week. I, this weekend is the uh, Oscars here in the United States, right? Yeah. One of the many, 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 many celebrations that people in the entertainment industry put on for themselves to pat themselves on the back and pat their buddies on the back, right? Entertainment is gigantic, gigantic business. It always has been, but not to the degree that it is today. And in that same part of 2 Timothy, Paul writes to him and says, men will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So that's something that is, it's always been there, but never to this degree. And that is all signs of the last days, the perilous last days. So, yeah, you're right, you know, to say that that transition, I believe, with all my heart, has been evident in my lifetime. It's been evident. I was saved in the, in the mid-1970s, mm -hmm. which was a time there was a revival. There was a spiritual revival here in the United States, no doubt about it. But the fact is, you know, I, I, I've seen since that time an incredible change in the church in these last 44 decades. It's, it's mind-boggling to see how much change there has been. But that, that change can be summed up in this, I think. The greatest part of that change has been a separation by the church from the Word of God. Yes. And we'll talk about that here because that's what becomes evident and important in our study of the church. And I'm using that term loosely at Laodicea. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, did that answer your question? I don't remember what your question was. <laughs> when did a long the time transition ago. Yeah. happen? Okay. But it's not complete by any means. No. It's, it's taking it's in, place. It's in the process. Right. It's, it's not, still in the yeah. process. It's not even complete here at Laodicea in the year 90 AD. That's right. Because while this church, and I will say that this, this thing that is called a church is not a church at all right. by any scriptural definition. Jesus hasn't given up on them. Mm -mm. There is still the possibility. Yes. There is still the possibility, not that the church as a group is going to be brought back into a right relationship, but that individuals mm -hmm. in that group can be brought back into a right relationship with God. How do I know that? Because here's where we're starting in the Bible study tonight. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Mm -hmm. When Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. 
So Jesus is still trying to call people in that body into a right relation, out of that body, and mm -hmm. into a right relationship with him. Yes. Okay? That's what's so important in this day and age. Because it says the Lord does nothing without revealing it to his prophets. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of his prophets is to go out and call people back into a right relationship, his people, into a right relationship with him. Yes. So Jesus is saying, I stand at the door and knock. You know, Jesus said, when, back when he was talking to his disciples, and I'm going to read from Luke chapter uh, 12. He said to them, be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. He's talking about his return. Last day's stuff, right? Mm -hmm. He said, be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. What verse was that? That's Luke 12, verses 35 and 36. Immediately open the door when he knocks. Mm. Okay? Now, there's no indication. It, there's, it, it would seem to imply here that Jesus, you know, he stands at the door and knocks. He's, he's there on the outside, and he's knocking. Right? Who knows how long he will knock? It's like... It would be, if somebody came to my door right now and knocked on the door, chances are good I would ignore it <laughs> because I don't want to interrupt the Bible study, okay? So if somebody knocked on the door, they would knock and knock and knock and not getting an answer, they would walk away. Mm -hmm. Don't believe for a moment that there will come a time when Jesus will give up knocking at that door mm -hmm. and will walk away. But that brings me to something I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about a logical look at this. Now, I, I know a lot of Christians who are afraid of the word logic. Well, if you think that it's, it's leaning on your own understanding, which it says in Proverbs 3 not to do, I'm not talking about that. Logic to me is you take a truth, you combine it with another truth, and a conclusion becomes inevitable. Right? right? That's logic. Okay, this, you take this, which you know to be true, and you take this, which you know to be true, and this, this has to be the result, all right? Mm -hmm. So let's look at a couple of things here. Facts that we know. These are facts. Mm -hmm. This is not supposition. Yeah. It's not what I think. It's not my opinion. These are facts from the Word. Let me go to Revelation chapter 3, okay. which I'm not there. Okay. You're probably all there except for me. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Fortunately... I have until Jesus comes back. And when he does, hallelujah. Revelation 3.20, which I just read, right? Mm -hmm. Here's what we know to be fact. Jesus is separated from this assembly of people. Yes. That's a fact. Yes. They're in there. And He's out there. Said. There's a separation. Fact. He promised that he would never leave or forsake us. Hebrews 13, 5. Correct. It's a fact. So if there's separation, <clears throat> the separation comes from the church, that, that body of believers right. went away from him. Right. Not the other way around. Correct. Okay? That's a logical conclusion from the facts we know. Yes. They left Jesus. Mm -hmm. Fact. The church, the true church, is a work of Jesus. He said, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. Yes. The focus of the church, we know this to be fact, is to be Jesus himself. A church is a, people gathered in his name, Matthew 18, 20. The church at Laodicea that we're studying does not recognize the absence of Jesus. That's, right. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. So the conclusion, the only logical conclusion you can come to is that this assembly of people is not a church. Mm -hmm. Correct. Is it, okay? And it is not the work of God. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's a logical conclusion based on what we know to be true. Here's a fact. They believe that they are rich and have everything. They have need of nothing. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a fact. It's here in the Word. God's Word is true, by the way. It's fact. Right? They are, in fact, poor and wretched 
and naked. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. They are blind to the truth. That's a fact, Jesus said. The conclusion can only be they are not abiding in God's word, which would have caused them to know the truth. Yes. Read John chapter 8, verse 32. Mm -hmm. So if you abide in his word, you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a little application of logic to this thing so far, right? Right. Okay. The church at Laodicea is not abiding in God's word. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's too difficult. Last In our last session, I talked, uh, I think, a couple times, or the one before that, about the great apostasy that Jesus oh, right. spoke of in Matthew 24, <clears throat> the, the great apostasy that, that Paul wrote about, right? The great falling away. Mm -hmm. They walked away from Jesus. Yes. Why would anybody walk away from Jesus? Now, you know, people say you can't lose your salvation. You can give it back. Give it I, I agree with that statement. You can't lose it. It's not like, oh, where did I put it? You, you can know? give it up. But you can give it up. Jesus said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. That does not prevent the fact that a possibility that a human can walk away from a relationship with Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. which is a divorce. Mm -hmm. And it says in Malachi, God hates, hates divorce. divorce. Okay? It says in John 6, 6, 6, John 6, verse 66. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Right? Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number of the beast is that of a man, and his number is 666. Revelation 13, 18. Do you honestly think that it's coincidence that out of the thousands of verses in the Bible, and remember, these were not written with chapter numbers and verse numbers when they were, yeah. and the fellow did it, did not sit down and say, well, I want to make sure I, I wind up getting to this point, right? But coincidentally, if you believe in coincidence, and, which I don't, okay, John 666 comes to the place where people walked away from him, left him. So the church of Laodicea, has departed from Jesus Christ. Yes. That is an evident fact based on the truth, right? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, how does that come to be? Yes. How does that how does that come to be? I, I said now I said that what I what I take from this is in John chapter six, because this is a you know this is the only place where there's such a clear picture of people, disciples by the way, not just not just hangers on here. In John chapter 6, it's talking about many of his disciples walked away, left mm -hmm. him, right? This is the clearest picture of people who had a relationship with Jesus Christ choosing to walk away from him. And they said it was because his word too was too difficult, mm -hmm. okay? So now, I want to give you a, what I think is a valid synonym for the Church of Laodicea, which, in, again, I'm going to say, if you want to use the word church... Yeah. Use it judiciously because I think in the literal sense of the word, they are they are an assembly of people, but they are not a church, okay? So here's where I want to take you. And what I believe we are facing today, in at least in the Western world, uh, and much of the, much of, I, I say the Western world, in my, we've been, Alice and I have been blessed. We have uh, spent time, and we lived in Latin America. We lived in Central America. We've traveled the Caribbean, we've traveled uh, all of North America, we have traveled in Central America, South America, we have been on East Africa and West Africa, we have been all through the United Kingdom, traveled much of Europe and, and ministered there, been out to the Mideast, right? What I see today in these perilous last days is what I would call the Church of the Golden Calf. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay? If you want to call it a church, let's call it the Church the of the Golden Calf. Okay. Okay. Now, if you know the story in Exodus, and we're going to we're going to go to Exodus, and I want to I want you to join me reading parts from Exodus chapter thirty-two. But before you go to Exodus thirty-two, you need to understand the setup here. Now, God has been using Moses. The Word of God has been coming to people through Moses. Yes. 
Moses was the most humble of men on the earth at that time. Yes. And he was a prophet of God. All right. He is the prophet, the priest, the king. I mean, you know, he is kind of the, the worldly representation of the Lord at that time. All right. Mm -hmm. But here in Exodus 24, God calls Moses. And it says in verse 12, Now the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandments which I have written for their instruction, the instruction of the people of God. Okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. So Moses goes up on the mountain and leaves the people behind. However, he doesn't just leave them. He just doesn't walk away. No. Because it says in verse 14 there in 24, But to the elders he said, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a legal matter, let him approach them. Right. In other words, he did not leave them without a, 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 somebody, somebody placing somebody to shepherd them, somebody in authority over them, all right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So he didn't just abandon them and go no, up on the mountain. No. Before he left, he did what was proper and placed somebody in that position of responsibility to shepherd yes. the flock. Okay. Now we're going to start reading in Exodus chapter 32. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled, there's that assembly, mm -hmm. about Aaron, Aaron and said to him, Come. Make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Well, why not? Why not? He said where he was going and why he was going, right? So Aaron, who has now been placed in responsibility to keep them right, to shepherd them, says to the people, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And, and they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Hmm. This people who had seen... The hand of God in ways over that you over never had. Over. The plagues in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, the, the destruction of the army that was chasing them. This was the God that they saw, right? Mm -hmm. And now they're saying, well, let's, let's make our own God. So, they make, so Aaron makes this golden calf. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an order, altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. I want to tell you, they didn't stop being religious. If anything, they got more religious. Yes. We're going to have a feast. Okay? So the next day, they rose early and offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat. eat wait a minute. They brought burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. They're doing the religious stuff. stuff. Yeah. Okay? They're doing the religious stuff. Mm -hmm. But they kind of add something to it. They sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Mm -hmm. They were lovers of pleasure. Yes. Okay? Entertained. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and he said, Go down at once for your people whom you brought up. All of a sudden, God calls them your people, not nice. my people. Not his. I mean, all of a sudden, God looks at this at, at the people that he did the, the, the plagues of Egypt to deliver. And rather than calling him my people, he says to, to Moses, your people. Hmm. Don't think that God is not a serious guy, okay? Hmm. He said, for your people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. The church of Laodicea is corrupt. That is the proper word. Yes. And I am telling you that much of what is called the church today, and if this sounds judgmental, you know what? We're supposed to... Was Elijah judgmental when he came and, and spoke on Mount Carmel? Was Moses judgmental when he came down the mountain? Was Jesus Christ judgmental when he went through the temple and overturned the, the tables of the money? This, is this judgmental? 
Or is it recognizing the truth and the facts and crying out to people? Behold, he's knocking at the door. Repent. Hold on a second. Okay, what, what, while you're holding on, let me just... But it, it's so important because he said, your people have corrupted themselves. So much of the church today is corrupt. The church is supposed to be holy and blameless, without spot or wrinkle. That's what Christ is coming back for, not corrupting. Uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is inspired God by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Some There's a word going around, uh, doctrine. Or, uh, you know, you have to have correct doctrine. The, do the, the doctrine is based on scripture verses put together logically as building blocks for your faith. Solomon wrote and said, there's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. and, and as we started this, I talked about a lot of this is a matter of degree. Okay. Mm -hmm. In other words, all this has been there. I always want to read to you to kind of follow on what Mark is saying. When Jesus encountered the Pharisees and scribes in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 7, it says that the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? The Pharisees had built their own traditions. That's right. All right? They had formed their own doctrines. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but in their heart is far away from me. In vain do they worship me, mm. teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. That's right. And he, said, he was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Now we're going to get into that more here mm. in, in this session. Probably not in this particular mm -hmm. part, but... So anyhow, you got this picture, right? That while Moses is away, even though he had put Aaron and her in charge, the people, because they're not they're not in a personal relationship with God. Yeah. They they are totally dependent on hearing from somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And when Moses doesn't show up, That's then right. what happens? They start they make a golden calf. And by the way, the first thing they do is say, well, "Okay, this is this is God." They don't recognize that it's not God. They don't recognize how evil it is. They don't recognize how corrupted they have been. So it says in verse 8, They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded, commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. I'm going to tell you, and... I promise you, this is going to be very, very controversial. So if you want to go away, go away now. Because you, a lot of you aren't going to like what I'm about to tell you. Remember, what they did is they all of a sudden, they formed their own God. church oh, right. separated from, from God. Right. All right? Mm -hmm. They make this, this idol they, that they begin to worship. And they're idolizing it. All right? Mm -hmm. By the way, idolatry can come in a lot of forms. So they are worshiping what they made with their hands instead of worshiping the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Okay? I'm going to go to Romans chapter 1. And you might want to go with me. Or you might, you might not. not. <laughs> in Romans chapter 1, I'm going to read from verse 20. We'll just, uh, For since the creation of the world... Talking about God, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, for the so that they are without excuse. Yes. Who's without excuse? I'll tell you one group, the Church of Laodicea. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other group is back there. Yeah, but in Exodus 32. Absolutely. There is no excuse. For even though they knew God. They did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Mm -hmm. Professing to be wise, they became fools. 
Now, isn't that the case? Yes. With Laodicea? Yes. They're professing, we're rich, we have need of nothing, right? They have all, they're, they're boasting in what they have. When God, Jesus Christ, stands and says, you're poor and wretched, naked, you have nothing. They exchange the glory of the incorruptible, incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Isn't that what they did in Exodus 32? Yes, that is. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for what they had made, and they became corrupt. So it says in verse 34, 24, excuse me, Romans 1, 24. Don't get me too excited here. I go too fast. I go too fast for me. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. There's a lot of talk in the world today. First of all, homosexuality is becoming a law of the land, has become accepted. Every, to say that it's accepted is too much of an understatement. Because in much of the world, much of the world that Alice and I travel and, and minister in, it is promoted, a, guarded. It, it is a crime to speak against it. Mm -hmm. Now I want to say something. I happen to be a fan of Apple technology. I have an iPhone. I have an iPad. I have an i you know a, a Mac. I like the technology. I'm getting to the place where I really can't stand their their philosophy. Yes. Um, the CEO. The CEO, Lord, may your grace be poured out on the people I'm going to speak of. Yes. Their CEO, Tim Cook, openly declared himself to be a homosexual just recently. He has become very, very active in promoting the, the quote-unquote gay agenda. Mm -hmm. There was an article in the news just the other day, which you probably didn't see because it was kind of buried. Right. Mm -hmm was that they had somebody who acted as a consultant or um, what do you call it when somebody goes to Washington on your behalf? A lobbyist. And, and they found out that they discovered that this fellow had been a supporter of old-fashioned man and woman marriage. So they ended his contract. Just like the other guy a few months ago, uh, Firefox or Foxfire? Oh, yeah, the bad CEO CEO. just... He lost, his, he lost his job, yes, because basically it is still a crime in this country. You'll be punished if you speak out against homosexuality, like I'm doing right now. But if you mess with me, you better count on messing with my guy. Okay. I, I give you fair warning now. And I thought to myself, because I, I actually made a comment on the, on the site just about the fact that I didn't understand. It seemed like this company that is saying so much... They are promoting tolerance. It seems to be very intolerant. And it started kind of a firestorm on, on, on the web. Uh, but the fact is, Apple is in the business of technology. Mm -hmm. They are not in the business of promoting a gay agenda. Uh, if they are, if that has become their model, their business model has become, and by the way, they are now the richest company in the history of the world. Does that remind you of Jesus tempting yes. Jesus in the wilderness? Just the bow devil, down. Just bow down. Jesus. Just bow down and worship me. Or yes. even in the no, 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 need of nothing. No, no, no. no. no, no, no. no, no I'm talking. What I'm talking about specifically, Satan, Satan says, if you worship me, all of this glory, all of this riches will be yours. All right. And now, okay, you you connect the dots. Connect it. Okay, you connect the dots. So I, I just distracted myself here. Oh. But if it has become the business model of Apple to promote homosexuality, lesbianism, transgender, and that, that stuff, if that's their business model, that's part of their business model now, I think as a public company, they should let the Securities and Exchange Commission know so that any potential or current investor wouldn't understand that that's, that's okay. what they're, they're putting money into. Okay, I, I did. I, I do distract myself, but I, that that goes to show you that what's happening in the world that we live in, that homosexuality went from being when I was a young man, it went from being prohibited to being permitted 
to being, now it's being promoted. Without doubt, okay? And people in the church and outside are debating, you know, how does this come about? Are they, did they choose homosexuality? Are they born homosexual? And this debate rages. It's the most foolish thing that I've ever heard of in my life. Because there's one cause and one cause that the Bible gives for homosexuality, and I don't call it homosexuality, it becomes homocentricity, where man becomes the center rather than God. And because of that, to go on here, all right, because they worship the creature rather than the creator, it says in Romans 1.26, for this reason, God gave them over to, a de to degrading passions. For their women in exchange a natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way, also, men abandon the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men. In verse 28, it says, They did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. God gave them over to a depraved mind. That, my friend, is the reason for homosexuality. Worshipping the creature rather than the creator. God gives them over to a depraved mind. And homosexuality is rampant in the Church of Jesus Christ today. It is promoted within the Church of Jesus Christ today. If there was a time to repent, this is it. Yes. And don't you'll never be able to say you didn't hear it if you're hearing this. Mm -hmm. Who is Jesus speaking to when he stands at the door and knocks? The church. Then why is it that every time that I've ever seen it, you can walk into almost virtually any Christian bookstore. And it's all about evangelism. This is Jesus, the nice evangelism picture. Jesus saying, he's speaking, he's not speaking to the unsaved, or he is speaking to the church. Behold, I stand at the door of a church, or that assembly, mm -hmm. and knock. This is a word to, to people who are supposed to be the believers, who are supposed to be the ambassadors for Christ, who are supposed to be the temples of the Holy Spirit who are supposed to be those people who bring the knowledge of the presence of Jesus Christ into every place. This is Christ speaking to the church. Can I add something sure. here? But, but this is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, yeah, I, I verse 11 that. through 13. But actually I wrote to you not to associate, associate with any so-called brother, if he should be an immoral person or or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunker, or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But to those who are outside, God ju judges. Remove the wicked from among yourselves. Okay. okay. The, the, the point is... Paul asks the question, you know, do you not judge mm -hmm. those? Well, the point is, no, not, not really. The church does not seem to either discern the problem in the church or deal with the, the problem in the church. And there is very little righteous judgment and indignation at what's going on in the church. So, well, you know what? I'm not, I know that I'm not the only voice crying in the wilderness. I know that there are other people that are out there that are bringing this message of repentance to the yes. church. If you're hearing this message, please, this is serious. This is serious, serious stuff. It's more serious than anything you're going to watch when you turn on your television. Right. It's more serious than anything. This is more serious that you're hearing. dealing with God. What did Paul, Paul says in Romans, here in Romans, what God saved us from, he saved us from, when we are saved, we are saved from the wrath of God. If ISIS scares you, you had better see our God, who is a consuming fire, on that last day when he returns to those who have rejected him, to those who have walked away from him. It's not a pretty picture. I want to say one more thing about homosexuality before. The devil is a, a liar by nature and the father of lies. He's had an awful lot of practice in this. And the first revelation of the serpent in the Bible was that he was more craftier, more subtle than any other beast of the field. Mm -hmm. He is doing a phenomenal job today of convincing people that this issue 
of homosexuality, I'm going to call it what it is, is about love. It is not about love. It is about sex. Lust. And, yeah. yeah. L let me, I, I, I wish maybe I'll zoom in on me so you can see me say this. I love a man. My greatest love is the love of a man. His name is Jesus Christ. I love Mark. Yes. I just don't want to have sex with him. Right. <laughs> Homosexuality is about sex. It's not about love. Not at all. Jesus commanded us to love one another. Absolutely. That's the great command of God, that you love one another as I have loved you, he said. It's not about love. It's about lust. I have no problem with a man loving a man. That's not the issue. But the devil and the world have turned that into the issue. It's all about love. It's not about love. It is about sex. That's why it's called homosexuality. It's not, it's not called homo level alley. I couldn't even say it. That's probably why it's not called it, because you couldn't say it. Okay. I don't say this. Listen, I'm, I'm not trying to say this for anybody's condemnation. The message is repent. The message is that Christ died on a cross so you would have the fullness of life. He died to take away the sin that we all came into this world carrying. He died to take away the sin that, that the, only, the only punishment for sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And he took that sin upon himself. And it's there as the free gift of God for anybody who will receive it. Anybody. Don't think for a moment that I haven't committed sins that were worthy of death. I, I, I would never say that. But I am the subject of God's grace and mercy. Hallelujah. As everybody who is called by the name of Jesus Christ is. And this is his message. It's not a harsh message. Listen, this church of Laodicea is as bad as you can get. And yet Jesus is still standing there knocking at the door and calling out to them. He wants that right relationship. Peter wrote and said that God desires that none should perish. All right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God That's desires amazing. to change me. God desires to change you. It takes force. It yes. takes power. And we're going to talk about that next, next week. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Father, that even a church of Laodicea that has gone so far astray and left you, walked away from you, and yet you are still calling out to individuals there to come out and be with you. Lord, I pray that there are people in a church of Laodicea, church of the golden calf today, that they would hear your knock, that they would hear your voice calling, and they would come out and be with you, Lord that they might be at that wedding feast. Lord, we know that we need change in our lives. We surely have not reached perfection, but I thank you that you are the potter and we are the clay, and you are still working your will and your pleasure in our lives, your good pleasure. Lord, change us. Change our hearts, O oh Lord. Cleanse our hearts, O oh Lord. Make us the people that you desire us to be, especially in these perilous last days. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the love that you've given us for your word, particularly that word made flesh who dwelt among us, your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, until next time, I know that Alice, as always, wants to tell you, Jesus loves you a lot. So, this week, be used for the glory of God's name. Cry out to him to be closer and closer to him. See you next time. God bless you.